another example of the Prophet's loyalty and this is a really important one. One question is, we know there were hypocrites in Medina and some of those hypocrites, the damage they did to Islam and the danger they posed on Islam was not any less than some mushriks and we know that the Prophet fought the mushrikeen when they would come to the battle, he'd fight them and he told Muslims go fight them, kill them when they come here because they're enemies of God waging war against us. Some of the hypocrites in Medina, even though they conspired and they were very dangerous, the Prophet did not kill any one of them. Why? Some munafiqs, their danger on Islam was greater than some mushriks. The mushriks, the Prophet killed them, meaning he allowed the Muslims to kill them when they would come and fight. But the munafiqs who were planning behind the scenes, conspiring against the Prophet, some munafiqs even during the Aqaba tried to kill the Prophet, some munafiqs, some companions tried to kill the Prophet, this is even mentioned in Sunni sources, right? But the Prophet didn't kill them, he didn't execute them, why? Yes? Because publicly they didn't hurt Islam and they gave him a chance to repent, maybe they would repent one day. Like the but they're causing damage now, I mean imagine if there's an assassination plot, like you're told this companion is trying to kill me, like why don't you kill him? Yes? Uh, is it because it would look like Rasulullah is killing Muslims? The hadith from the Prophet ﷺ, he himself says, the Prophet says in one hadith, لَوْ أَنِّي لَوْ لَا أَنِّي أَكْرَهُ أَنْ يُقَالْ إِنَّ مُحَمَّدًا إِسْتَعَانَ بِقَوْمٍ حَتَّى إِذَا ظَفَرَ بِعَدُوِّهِ قَتَلَهُمْ the Prophet says, if it weren't for my fear and concern, that it would be said out there that Muhammad he used the help of his companions, right? Because initially they helped him at Bad and some other battles. Then later when he became powerful, he killed his own companions. The Prophet says, this is not befitting for my reputation. If it were not for this case, I would have killed many. Many deserve to be killed. And we know one of them, the one who killed his daughter, Ruqayya. We've talked about this in detail before, remember? Who killed the daughter of the Prophet Ruqayya? He beat her until she basically died. He was, he was her husband, married to her. Who was he? Uthman. Uthman was married to Ruqayya. Now some say she was the stepdaughter, but most ulama believe she was the daughter of the Prophet. And another act of treason that Uthman committed, if you remember, he gave refuge to one of those enemies of the Prophet, and we've, we've talked about the details before. The Prophet is saying, if it were not for this fundamental point, I would have killed many. But because I as a leader, I have to have some sort of wafa and loyalty, even though these, some of these companions are hypocrites according to the Quran and I know they're conspiring, they're causing trouble, but it's just be unbefitting right now for me to kill them. Because if I were to, to kill them, what would people say in history? Muhammad used his companions, then he killed them. Exactly like how revolutions do, have you seen like coup d'etats, revolutions? To the point, to the point where there is a statement that every thawra, revolution, eats its babies or members. They say that in politics. Usually what happens is you have a general who leads a, a revolution, he topples the government, then he establishes his own government. The first thing he does after that is what? He, he starts killing his own people because he sees them as a threat. Almost every revolution has done that in history, right? Yes, he's trying to purge them. The Prophet wanted to be different, no. Don't think that I have a worldly uh, pursuit over here. And this, this, this harms Islam if I have such an image that I killed my own companions. So for the greater good, he had to forgive them. Otherwise the Prophet is indicating in this hadith, they deserve to be killed. If it were not for this point, I would have had many killed. <laughs> and that explains because see today, one argument that comes up when we're 
having dialogue with uh, uh, you know other Muslims from other schools of thought, well if these companions are as you Shia believe, then how come the Prophet lived with them, he coexisted with them, he never killed them, he never executed them, he never arrested them, come on how, how do you want me to believe that? So they're not as bad as you guys say, even those, uh, come, they're, buried next to him. they're buried next to him right? The Prophet yes coexisted with them, because the Prophet had to be loyal. In the end, even if they were hypocrites, as long as initially they stood on his side as Muslims publicly, the Prophet has an obligation not to fight them. It's as simple as that. That answers a lot of questions about our history and why the Prophet, because many of us always tell, many of them always tell us, well couldn't the Prophet, if he's such a bad person and he's going to kill the daughter Prophet, why couldn't he kill him? Why didn't he exile him? The Prophet answers the question here, I have to be loyal. Yes? Okay, but that, that last option, why not just exile them? Why not to kill them? Just... Because even if you exile them, people will say the Prophet used them when he could and they attended better let's say, and then when he didn't need them, he kicked them out of his uh, society, it's, it's not appropriate. He only exiled two, Marwan ibn al-Hakam, and his dad, he was a baby and the reason why he uh, exiled Marwan's father is because he mocked the Prophet, see the Prophet would be walking, he's walking behind the Prophet, he makes faces, funny faces about the Prophet, okay such a person who openly, see at least those other munafiqs, the other hypocrites openly they'd respect the Prophet, like in the masjid they're not going to mock him, openly they preserved the respect, Marwan's father, he did not maintain that public respect, so the Prophet over here to support Islam and to maintain his dignity, he had to ask him to leave, but those, those others they didn't do that, they didn't openly mock the Prophet like that, even though they gave him a hard time sometimes, they would say something out of line, but at least it was not publicly exiling them, yes, one thing that they did when the Prophet was on his deathbed, when he wanted to write that will and they said you know he's hallucinating, the Prophet told them leave, he did kick them out of his house, but at that point he could not kick them out of Medina, they did disrespect him publicly and that's why the Prophet kicked them out, that's why some people say why didn't the Prophet still insi not insist on writing the will, it's not appropriate anymore, they broke that sanctity, so any will you write anyway they're going to disregard it, and then they will start doubting all your other statements they and they could forge their own anyway and you have to make a statement, you disrespected me, leave, yes the Prophet did kick them out of his house, uh, yes brother, was, was there a question? So you know the, when Uthman killed the daughter of the Prophet, had the Prophet punished him then it'd be justified but instead he married another daughter to Uthman, so I mean that kind of doesn't make sense to me. So we, we did talk about that um, when we talked about how the Prophet threatened Uthman when he attended the funeral, the Prophet hinted to him, he told him yesterday the one who did so and so meaning you Uthman, leave, if you don't leave the funeral now, I'm going to expose you, the Prophet warned him, he left, so the argument is why allow him to marry another of your daughters, Um Kulthu? as many historians have stated, assuming that this is what happened, assuming, many historians have said that. I can give several answers here that scholars have mentioned, number one it's a trial, it's a test, today, today many Muslims even though they know what Uthman did right, during his caliphate, but they still call him the Nurain, the one who has two lights and what do they mean by that? Because he married two of the Prophet's daughters, right? it's a test, when you have someone married to two daughters of the Prophet, Allah's testing you, are you still going to follow him or no? It's a trial, always think of these trials, remember why did the Prophet marry Aisha and Hafsa? Trial, Imam Ali salam said it, remember when we talked about Aisha's biography, Imam Ali salam at Jamal, before Jamal, he said, Inna Allah abtalakum bi ummikum, Allah tested you with your mother, meaning Aisha, for Allah to see, do you follow her or you follow him? 
Look at the wording of Imam Ali. Allah tested you with your mother to see do you follow her, do you obey her or you obey him. And many Muslims at Jamal, they obeyed her, not God. It's a test. So this is a trial. That's number one. Number two, scholars have mentioned Uthman comes from the powerful Umayyads. Umayyad tribe was very powerful in Mecca. By allowing Uthman to marry the first and the second time, the Prophet was doing his best to diffuse the enmity of the Umayyads against him. Such that, such that, had the Prophet not allowed uh, Uthman to marry his second daughter, some historians believe that at Uhud and onwards after Uhud, the Meccans would have just mobilized uh, their fighters to the point where they would have probably eradicated Muslims. Khalas, that's it, we just need to go and get rid of Islam and Muslimin. And remember, at Uhud they almost did. They got very close. The Prophet, a few just left, uh, were left defending him. But the fact that Uthman, who's one of the Umayyads, was married to the Prophet's daughter, it kind of reduced that animosity or that willingness to come and kill all of them. They still had enmity, they still fought him, but it's just less. Like imagine if your daughter is on the other side, you still, you still consider that side your enemy, but you're not gonna fight with the same level of passion because there's some sort of relationship here. So that's another reason that the Prophet allowed him to marry her. And number three, maybe Allah, Allah wants to elevate the Prophet, giving him a son-in-law who, does, who is abusive to his daughters, that's one way that the Prophet is an example for everyone, that I had an abusive son-in-law, yet I maintained my akhlaq. Sayyid, didn't they, like all the stories you just said, weren't they like abusing the Prophet? Yes, that is abuse. That's why the Prophet says no one has been abused as much as I have. Ma udhiya nabiyun bimithli ma udhit. The Prophet says no one has been harassed, hurt, bothered like I have been. Take advantage of him. Absolutely, they took they took advantage of his kindness. Yeah. No doubt about that. 